Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is May 13th, uh, 2015, and um, for me this is a long-awaited now. <laughs> Jeremy contacted me a little while ago and said, uh, I'm excited about Hypothesis. So we started playing with Hypothesis, um, and, and as soon as I started playing with Hypothesis, noticed that Greg was uh, on there all the time. So why don't the two of you introduce yourselves a little bit, and um, well, we're going to be talking about hypothesis. We're going to be talking about collaborative reading, reading together, annotating, um, all those exciting things. Jeremy has been the education czar over um, at, uh, what was that other place? Genius. Um, <laughs> and uh, you've moved over to, to hypothesis. So you can tell us a little bit about uh, your thinking around all that and uh, anything that comes up here um, as we go. Greg, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is um, Greg McVary. I'm currently um, in a, a professor, a, I forget the, the assistant, I think it's the first, the, the, the bottom of the rung, the level, um, <laughs> at Southern Connecticut State University. Um, and I investigate um, literacy and technology um, and have been trying to get more involved in uh, following Karen's footsteps into open educational resources, which is part of the reason I gravitated towards the hypothesis because it is um, um, the, the philosophy of open is just baked into its DNA. Um, and this idea of social reading and this idea that um, reading as, you know, the web has been a place to read and write, but I think we need to get back into this critical consumption of this big push of, oh, we, there's too many, there's, you know, we need to be creating. No, we need to be consuming, too, just critically. Um, and I think social annotation is a way to kind of get at that critical consumption. Okay. Jeremy, welcome. Welcome Thanks. back. You've been on a few other times. Yeah, it's great to be back. I love, I love TTT. Um, I think, uh, so, uh, you know, I was, uh, I'm a high, I've taught high school for uh, about five years total, no, seven, uh, let's see, I'm doing the math, seven years total in college for about seven years, and then found myself uh, in the tech industry as the education, director of education, or educations are a genius, trying to get uh, collaborative annotation, social reading uh, into classrooms, um, and over the past uh, six weeks have transitioned from uh, Genius to Hypothesis, uh, where my colleague John Udell has just joined us. Um, and, uh, you know, Greg just hit uh, some of the, the, the t you know, main reasons why I would make that move. I think, uh, you know, for one, Genius became less focused on education, and that's really my passion and my calling. Um, and so I wanted to go to a place that was going to really focus uh, its engineering and uh, philosophical resources on the education space, and that's Hypothesis, in my opinion now. But I think uh, Greg's point about critical consumption and uh, thinking about the tools that we use and the, the openness or uh, of those tools uh, is really important for teachers. That's a fact, um, and and should be important for teachers and for schools. And uh, hypothesis has that uh, ethos down in terms of really trying to make everything open and shared and accessible. Um, Karen, it's really great to have you on because we we are super interested in, in open education resources. So. Um, yeah, that's that's the story of how I got here, and I'm excited to talk about hypothesis. I've been on this uh, you know chat to talk about genius before a few times, uh, and I'm excited to to do it again with hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And you introduced John as a colleague. John, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, let me know if this is going to work for you. I'm doing this from an Android tablet, which I'm not sure is going to cut the mustard. So so far it's I'm working fine. So go ahead. Doing okay. Yeah. All right. So, hey, Paul, it's good to meet you. It looks like you started another of your Youth Voices little experiments recently. I saw a bunch of 18 names show up today. <laughs> really? I didn't even know that. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> is that somebody else? No, no, I'm sure that is. Um, no, I, yeah. You mean I personally? Oh, your well, glasses. Jeremy, well, so Jeremy, you should explain Jeremy. Because I don't have the whole there story may be, here. There may be other people using using the, that tag, though. That's all. You know. I I don't know. I mean, there it's kind of become a really popular tag. So John is a product manager at, at Hypothesis and has okay. 
a lot of connections in ed tech and, and education, um, and uh, came in about the same time as me to help uh, steer this ship in the right direction. And uh, so John is sitting on the fire hose and sees some of the tags that are coming up and yeah. knows Great. that Paul is one of the more active users and that Youth Voices is one of the more active groups on the site now. Um, so I'd be can, surprised if it wasn't your influence, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back for a second and just uh, give the quick description of what hypothesis is, and then maybe within that, say some of the like where did it come from, who's building it, um, what is it? We start with that simple description. So it's not a new idea. And to underscore the point, the founder of Hypothesis, Dan Whaley, has a spreadsheet that he keeps which records all of the efforts to implement annotation for the web going back to the Mosaic browser, as a matter of fact. So this idea has been around since the dawn of the web. Um, just like the original um, Amaya browser at the W3C, or not the W3C, at, at CERN, was a, was a read-write um, capability, the same is true for annotation. It's kind of always been there and it's just never really taken root. And um, you know, so so what is hypothesis? It's a platform and a product. And I guess you could say an ecosystem. So the the product is a browser extension and uh, a proxy and a set of bookmarklets that enable um, web annotation. The ecosystem is an emerging set of standards shepherded now by the W3C. So there's a, a W3C working group for annotation that's been formed relatively recently, just in the last year, I think, um, and is progressing towards standardization of a couple of things, one being the Oh, he might have froze. I know his. For building hooks for annotation into web browsers as a standard piece of the DOM of the of the browser's document. Are we losing John? Here and there we are a little bit. Um, Interoperable of client and servers. How how these things talk to one another. So what the API is going to look like in a standard sense. Um. Can I uh, underscore a couple things that John said? You were cutting in and out there, John, a bit. Uh, we heard interoperable, which is key. Um, just for those that aren't familiar, the W3C is a sort of major governing body of the internet. Is that right, John? Uh, which basically means that you know some of the, the oldest uh, folks have been involved in the creation of the web and are still monitoring. No, I'm getting the impression I should rejoin this call from my computer. So. Okay. I'm going to go do that in case, in case right, this is right, me. John. We'll see you in a second. I'll be right that back. Was great, though. We got a lot of it. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I'll just underscore the W3C point and I'll give a little explanation. Basically, this is the governing body, major governing body of the Internet, and they are interested in annotation. They've started a working group on annotation, which basically means their vision is that annotation will become part of the web. And as John was mentioning, this has been a part of the history of the web from the, from the birth of the browser, when Mark Andreessen imagined there to be annotation in the browser, but never, you know, never added that functionality to what became Netscape and is now Firefox. And so a lot of people are thinking about annotation right now, which is super exciting for and others. Um, and the hope is that it will be part of the daily life of the Internet, that Internet citizens will be going around the Internet and not only consuming passively um, the, the pages that they visit, but also actively participate in adding annotation in that people will be able to call up annotations on text where they want more information or want conversation. Um, that's the broad vision. Uh, am I screen sharing right now? Yes. You are. Yep, and now okay. I have it on the video that way. Go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you and you're screen sharing. Okay, I just, want to, I just wanted to show people what Hypothesis is in a practical sense. Um, this is what it looks like when you come to Hypothesis um, through the Chrome uh, browser. Uh, you have a few different options then to access the annotation layer that I described um, using the Hypothesis client. One is you can install a uh, Chrome extension, which appears up here in the upper right-hand corner. It's not turned on right now. That's why it's gray. You can just paste a link in 
and that will bring you to an annotatable version and, an, and possibly an annotated version if other people have been there before, version of any URL. You can use a bookmarklet if you're on a different, like Firefox. You can use this bookmarklet. Um, oops, lost my space there. Uh, or you can, if you have access to, uh, you know, the development side of your website, you can add uh, a little JavaScript to your website that will automatically uh, let you uh, annotate that page. So let me show you just quickly what it looks like while I'm screen sharing, and then I'll shut up. But if I wanted to annotate this page, I could grab the URL, I could go back to the Hypothesis main page and plug it in here, click Annotate, and it's going to open up that same URL with a little prepend here, which you could also add manually, this via.hypothesis with the dot before the is, prepended to the, to the previous URL. But now there's this sidebar here that I can open and see annotations, or I can just simply scroll to the article and see uh, the annotations like this. Um, so that's using what we call the proxy, the via proxy, is one way. And again, if I have, uh, if I have uh, the Chrome extension installed, it's up here in the upper right-hand corner. I can just click the Chrome extension. This is at the regular URL for the Atlantic article. If I click the Chrome extension, the same thing happens. Um, that little sidebar populates. I can open and close it. Um, I can scroll through the article and see uh, annotations. Um, and I can add. Uh, annotations like this. I select text and click annotate. I have a choice of either making my annotation public or private. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I can compose here. There's some rich text features. Uh, you can tag annotations and uh, both uh, Greg and, uh, and Paul are experts at hacking the system to make it work for classes. We're developing some, re you know, uh, features that are, are for classrooms, and anybody here in the chat or uh, in the video call, if you have ideas about what kind of functionality you'd imagine being necessary for the classroom, I definitely want to hear it so that we can tell John while he's here. <laughs> um, but they've been using tags to kind of form ad hoc groups. So uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, students of uh, Paul's have been using Youth Voices as a tag. And what that allows them to do is to have a, um, a stream of content based on their tag uh, that they can follow on the Hypothesis site. So this is actually a tag used by a massive open online course studying Shakespeare, and this is their annotations uh, related to what they're calling Mookspear. I think I'll shut up there. I just wanted to give a quick practical intro. I hope that was helpful, um, and I'll toggle off my uh, my screen share now, I think. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll add in right away the, just the notion that <clears throat> if there's any way to... Um, if there were a way to have my students who don't know about, who, who aren't really good taggers yet, for example, um, because they're registered as Youth Voices students, that they would automatically get that tag, or there'd be some other way to group them. But that's yep. just some of the thinking. Um, and that's the number one uh, feature. That the first feature that we're going to ship is a groups feature, so that you can you can form a group, Youth Voices on a page, and just see those annotations and eventually be able to form a Youth Voices group that will be interpage. But that is literally the top of our list of new features. And really the hack system that you're using for Youth Voices and that Greg is using for some other things is just a temporary hack to try to get it all in one place. But down the line, it's going to be much more automated. So, Because I, I, I totally feel you. There's a lot of people actually annotating on the Shakespeare course that don't put MOOC Shakespeare there. So you have to go to the, to the Folger pages and kind of you know scan and, and see that they're there. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's literally one of the first features that we're, or literally the first feature that we're going to ship. So I totally understand that need. And before I let Greg talk, <laughs> um, or Karen, I want to hear from Karen. I told, I told you he's going to keep me quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the the other thing that I always forget, and that um, you know, as project developers and so forth, you probably don't imagine, but I work with seventh and eighth graders who like to you know mess around, um, and. <laughs> I'd like to be able to edit their stuff, you know, so some administrative function to be able to do that would make me feel safer on the site. So Great. Let me just address that before we let Greg uh, go off, which is that uh, I'm hoping it's not in the current spec, but I've recognized what you're just mentioning, um, and I hope that we're going to roll out a group admin figure, a group moderator with this role um, that would have some advanced privileges 
maybe a dashboard functionality to view the work being done in a, in a, more, in a richer way. Uh, certainly the ability to archive, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second, like archive and annotation. But I just want to flag one thing that's super interesting about Hypothesis as opposed to Genius. Genius would allow teachers to edit completely and to completely delete content. They gave them those, that level of privilege. And it's interesting to me because I asked for that immediately. I was like, we've got to be able to delete stuff if it's no good, and we've got to be able to um, edit stuff if we can make it better. But that's actually not what Hypothesis is about. I think you know, being able to archive, the reason I say archive is that you would hide, if I was being a troublemaker in your class, you could hide my annotation. But you'd never be allowed to edit my annotation or completely delete it. And that's a philosophical mm -hmm. choice at Hypothesis about who this, th this is really a, 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 an open tool for anybody to use. And Genius has a much more of an editorial mindset where they want to create a kind of uh, circumscribed knowledge universe that is kind of controlled at some point top down. I mean, uh, it is very opening uh, in terms of who can participate and contribute, but at the same time, there's still somebody that can delete you if they don't want your stuff. They may be right, <laughs> but the point of hypothesis is not to say who's right or wrong. Um, the mm -hmm. point of hypothesis is to let people use this tool. So you would be able to archive it so that you'd be able to have a, a, a clean view of the text for your purposes of your classroom. But that student's annotation would still exist for, for their view. Um, and I think that that's actually a pretty interesting philosophical choice. Um, but I totally hear you that you know, you're going to have to do that kind of stuff um, to kind of clear the space for the right kind of conversation. And, and young, young people will be adding some things that may not be appropriate or, or just distracting. Even um, better yet, and because I, I do worry about uh, feature creep. Um, part of the reason I was attracted to hypothesis was it's just that lightweight. Like, um, but what you can do is, if your students post a um, an annotation that you don't, that isn't you know quote unquote up to snuff, is you can leave them comments and feedback, and then they can and then they can edit their original um, annotation based on that feedback, and it will note it um, that that's an edited annotation. Um, it actually notes it right on the annotation, so it's it's a great way to actually track student knowledge growth um, because you can provide them very explicit feedback to how they're annotating, and then be able to have them. Now, granted, what happens when something massively wildly inappropriate? You know, that's 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 a classroom management issue. But it, you know, that being able to hide an annotation is important. But I I I, I caution John and Jeremy. Often about the you know I I I like that there aren't that many features um, that it's you know it's but humans do suck at tagging like that is I think part of the that is if the internet's taught us anything over thirty years is we're just we're pretty bad at tagging I don't know why but um we you know so all right I'll stop now um, well we need to I, I think you're right Greg I have one question about what you just said but I think you know one concern is that if we imagine this taking off and there just being tons and tons of people annotating. Um, you're going to want to filter that somehow. And so the groups feature will allow you to have a little reading group in the New York Times that you can navigate the New York Times with your colleagues or friends. And you know, hopefully lots of other people will be there, but you won't have to see them because you might use your group. But you can see them. that They will be there, too. Groups I, I, have one question for you. I have one question for you, Greg. When you said, were you saying that if a student creates an annotation and you want to, quote, unquote, edit it, that you'll leave a reply, and then they can edit it? Be kind of a track record. Yeah, if you actually the post that um, John uh, did a blog post on um, annotating PDFs, and we'll talk about that feature in a second because that that is a big differentiator. The fact that you can annotate PDFs, especially for me in higher ed. Um, but what would happen is um, Dan and I would leave John a um, a comment in the annotations, or I would reply to Dan's annotation on John's post. And then um, John used that information to go back and either edit his annotations or his original writing. So if you're if you're doing it as so for youth voices, um, if you're doing it for youth voices, for for example, and it's on a writing piece, you can provide feedback to the writer as a form of annotation, and the writer can then go back and edit their original piece. Or on the flip side, if you want them to work on their annotations, all the annotations are editable. 
So as a teacher, I will leave a comment on somebody's annotation. And I could leave, I haven't done it yet, but I could imagine myself saying, please revise this annotation. And then they could then go um, up and revise the original annotation, and you get a, it's actually noted in the stream. It will say, right next to the um, link, it will say edited. Um, so it's an it's a, it's a interesting way to kind of track student growth in terms of how well that they're, they're reading. Yeah, as long as I mean, if it can be hidden, I can we can play with that. <laughs> no, but the group teachers, yeah, that, that's key for classrooms. Um, mainly because a lot of you know that was one of the features is that oftentimes um, students may not be um, so adept at annotating, and as the community grows, people get very particular about their annotations. So. Being, you know, having that little that safe place for kids to, to try before maybe they go out in the full public um, text is it, it, kind of a, a neat feature. Karen, do you want to jump in? Um, you're relatively new to hypothesis, I think. Any questions from your perspective at this point? Or? No, I mean I'm very new to it, but I guess one question is. Does everybody see everyone's annotations on a given page, or is there is that the group feature is to filter out? Yeah, the, the upcoming group feature will uh, will filter that out so that you could have a private group of students. You know, that's one reason why we think it's important for education is that uh, students may not be ready or comfortable, or you may not be ready or comfortable having students annotate uh, in the wild, as it were. I have long been an advocate of that just because I think there's nothing more powerful for a student than to realize that their audience is bigger than their teacher and, and even their classmates. Um, and I currently would argue that it's pretty safe because it's not like millions of people are using Hypothesis uh, or Genius in this actually. Um, and so you'd all ostensibly have a private space. Um, and they can edit their annotations, but this groups feature I think is going to be critical for classrooms in terms of a relative degree of privacy, and that, like I said, is our first feature that we'll ship. And as soon as John gets on, he can he can confirm that. Yeah. So so Karen, there's three basic features. There, there's the fire hose stream, and you get to see every single annotation in the world. Then you can do a stream based on the user. So I could just go see Karen's stream. Like you can go if you if you just go to Hypothesis and search for JGMac1106, all you you will see are my annotations. Or the third option, and this is kind of the hack thing that most people are doing right now with the classes, is you just make up a tag specifically for your class. Yes. So I we use a tag for the Twitter journal chat. So if you search for TGC15, or um, I'm going to be doing a project to teach um, source evaluation with an hypothesis, um, a research project in the fall, um, and I'll be using the hashtag question the web. Um, so you, that's how most people are kind of organizing their classes now by just determining a um, a tag for for a specific class. But if but if your students were annotating, say uh, the Orlando Patterson, I think it was article about um, you know the the sort of unrest in urban areas around African American you know communities um, in the New York Times last week. If you were annotated on that page, your students were annotated, and I turned it on, I'd be able to see their annotations. Yeah. So they would be public if you, you know, at the source. Um, but you'd be able to filter them, as John said, as Greg said, um, in these in these useful ways to kind of differentiate. And the likelihood is that you, you might be alone, except for me, on that particular Orlando Patterson article. <laughs> um, you like Greg, that, Greg? Uh, Greg, I love uh, I love that hashtag question the web. And it reminds me of something that I was thinking about today in terms of this technology, which is that, or something I've been thinking about for a couple weeks now, which is that as a long-time English teacher, you know, why are we teaching English? Why do I? Why, why do we have English in our curriculum? You know, uh, we're not. It's not. I don't think really to expose students to the um, to the work of Shakespeare itself. I think it's probably more of a means to an end. I mean, to some extent, it's good for them to be able to talk about to know those stories. But it's really about you know, and it's not radical to say you know. Critical reading, uh, critical thinking, and critical writing. Um, and the cool thing that I've been thinking about in terms of annotating the web is that so we want our kids to take those skills out into the world and be critical readers and critical thinkers and maybe even critical writers in the world, right? And annotating the web, you know, as an object of study um, is kind of really getting to some kind of essence of what 
ELA is all about in my mind, and in my, at least in my last two weeks of thinking about this, uh, because you know the web is the you know the world in a sense, the World Wide Web. It is the object that is in front of us, the thing that we're interacting with almost as much as our you know daily physical experiences out in the world. Um, and to be critical readers there, to go there and say I can act there and, and and make a comment, and and to be writers there, um, is a really powerful mechanism for. ELA classes. And so the question the web, I just like that phrasing because it makes me think of this idea that you go out there and it's not it's not something that's static. It's something that you need to think about and you now have a tool that you can act on it with. Um, well, well, if there's anybody that out there that wants to get involved. I don't know if that's what you're getting at with that, but, uh, but I like that hash. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a, probably a two-month course, uh, not a, a community, not a course per se, but um, opening up to middle schools and high schoolers nation worldwide um, come this fall. But uh, I've actually baked uh, hypotheses, into, I, I always say hypothesis is, that period messes me, I, hypothesis into my you know writing workflow. Um, so if I have a primary or secondary source that I'm reading, I'll annotate it first, um, sit down, think on it for a little bit, then I will go back um, and I'll just tag that, I'll use a tag specifically for that source, or I'll go back and return that source and read my tweets, and then when I'm ready to actually blog, um, I can then pull up that source with my annotations. And sometimes I embed them in the, in the original posts, but I found it to, it has helped me out as a writer so much, um, being able to just get that into my everyday workflow. Where I've actually added um, a page of just my annotations onto my website, so I have a I have a, um, a all of my hypothesis annotations are just it's just a tab on my website for people to kind of follow along and watch what I try to do as I try to read and write in the open. Of course, I, I think reading and reading in the open does maybe shift like reading socially does kind of shift the process of reading a little bit. Um, because now you're you're reading with an audience in mind, which is a little it's a little off-putting, but you know also important in the same sense. Um, and something I, I enjoy doing as part of my workflow. But yeah, I, I would have to agree, Jeremy. It's this idea that we can be able to do our thinking out loud and do our writing out loud. And it's the fact I I want to go back to John's point that this is as old as the web itself and just hasn't caught on. I'm hoping you know I'm thinking the, the time's right for it to really catch on. And, There's a couple of ways in which that's true. Oh, wait, is this thing on? Yes. Yeah, you're on. Yes, John, Sorry. we can't see you, but we can hear you. I've been right. through three computers and two browsers, and I still don't have a working camera today, but... Yeah. Um, well, we can hear you. Go ahead. It's fine. Apparently, I have a voice. So, yeah, just to sort of amplify what Jeremy was saying, I think it's really important for your students to develop a sense that these annotations are part of their life stream. And... Yep. One of the ways that becomes important is, so for example, those of them who move into scientific careers are going to be expected to do peer review of scientific publications. And right now, peer review is hobbled in a lot of ways, but one of the ways it's hobbled is that the annotations that I make on somebody else's article live in a silo that belongs to one or another publisher of scientific articles. And there's a big problem getting people co to commit to do that because it, the work doesn't accrue back to them. It's not, in I suppose your terms, part of their e-portfolio. Yep. Right? It gets fragmented into a bunch of silos. And you know what I love about the hypothesis model is that this is part of my permanent life stream if I choose to regard it that way. And so as a scientist, I ought to expect that whether I've been annotating an article on PLOS or on another journal somewhere else, right, that, you know, all of the work that I've put into thinking about that stuff and writing about that stuff accrues to me. It's part of my life stream. I have control over that, that, that stream of data. And come 10-year view time, I can, I don't, you know, I don't have to go to 150 different places to pull it together, right? I have the record of my engagement with my peers as part of my live stream. I think that's really and, powerful. And that's, that's I think, you know, you're phrasing that in terms of like a, a professional uh, scholar, but I think for a young person, the e-portfolio, the term you're, you're using is, 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 you know, exactly right, that this is a way to 
track students, uh, you know, across the web and, and monitor, you know, see how they're thinking, see how they're writing, see how they're reading, um, and they can build a portfolio. They, and it's not just a portfolio for a class. It's really, it can be if you set up the curriculum right based on their own intellectual inquiry. They could be annotating ESPN <laughs> uh, or Wikipedia. Yeah. Let's let's actually talk about Wikipedia for a minute because yeah, know, six or seven years ago, Gardner Campbell invited me down to the University of Mary Washington for their faculty tech summit and um, that's how we got to be buddies and at the time I remember talking to the faculty there who were really excited about the way that they were using wikis in the classroom and the way that they were using them was like blue books basically so they would spin up wikis and they would be course specific and students would come in and you know work in the wiki for a period of time and at the end of the class the wiki would be evaluated and then they would be graded and the wiki would be discarded. It was like a blue book that got tossed aside. And so my, my proposal to them was why don't you actually have them operate in the real Wikipedia where they have to engage with you know, the culture of Wikipedia and learn what it takes to actually get um, an improvement accepted at, into Wikipedia. And there was a lot of pushback from their side because, well, how would we evaluate and grade that work? But the reality also is that those students would have a horrible experience, right? They would effectively just be rejected and almost nothing that they tried to do would make it into Wikipedia, except as being buried in a bunch of obscure history logs. Well, you know, if you used an overlay approach, right, the work that they did would be available whether or not Wikipedia chose to accept it, right? And that's just a fundamentally interesting distinction. <coughs> And for those that don't know, John has been uh, pushing for everybody to read and write in the open and has been an advocate for the open web since well, since the web was born. Um, so it's I was really excited to see him join the Hypothesis team. Um, but that I, John, I, I'm stealing that idea. Um, instead of, because I, 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 I've been having my students, you know, read the discussion pages, especially the really controversial, like, lock topics in Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, versus looking at the Wikipedia article, but reading the, you know, reading the, the some of the hate on the discussion pages. Yep. Um, and so this idea of maybe annotating those discussion pages and, and investigating the claims there versus just on the main page without getting in, because, I mean, it can be, the discussion pages of Wikipedia can be, you know, interesting and both vitriolic. They can, you know, it depends on the, the article. Well, there's also a really troubling, in my view, a really troubling hostility to expertise mm -hmm. in Wikipedia. I know a number of academics who have written books on topics where they are the world's authority on that topic and then have gone to Wikipedia and been rejected by the Wiki police <laughs> um, and, and just walked away, right? And, and so their effort to improve Wikipedia was just, was just slapped down, you know, and in my view, this is the answer to that, right? You know, if somebody is the the world's authority on a subject, the world has various ways of knowing that person is an authority on that subject, and the world, or some of us anyway, might choose to view those portions of Wikipedia through the lens of that expertise, which is an option that we don't have right now. So, um, yeah. Maybe I'm going back or something, but let me let me try to ask this question. I, I think what I immediately worry about are two extremes, right? One is um, the annotation getting lost. Like, uh, how how do we keep track of of the kids in my class and their annotations? And the other extreme, though, is has been suggested here already, but um, the the problem of, of putting too much garbage on, on websites, right? So the answer, so, I think, is, so pretty, does, yeah. is pretty straightforward, right? I mean, Good. you know, look at Twitter. There was, I think was a time, I know there was a time, when you could actually view the Twitter firehose, right? And you can't anymore, right? I mean, you know, apart from the fact that, you, you know, no human being could keep up with that flow of material, there's not, there's not a place to go look at the Twitter firehose, right? You view Twitter through the lens of, the people that you've chosen to follow and the sources that you trust or are interested in. You know, so right now in its infancy, hypothesis is where Twitter was, you know, seven years ago, right? And in fact you can at the moment view the firehose. But that's just 
that's just a temporary situation, right? It won't last. In the end, you know, people will construct the views and the filters that work for them, and those will be the ways in which they experience that flow. And and it just, you know, I don't. I mean, I I kind of don't see it as a problem. I mean, it's it's. I understand the concern, and you know, given that we have not got the controls right now, to you know, uh, block the fire hose from from pages, you know, which we soon will have, you know, then it's certainly an issue. But yeah, I mean, nobody wants to see the Twitter fire hose. Nobody will want to see the the, the hypothesis fire hose, and no one will have to. I like the fire hose. <laughs> well, you know, it's, let's put it this way: Twitter, when Twitter was new, and you could look at the fire hose. Right, it was definitely a thing, you know. You wouldn't want to look at it now. No, um, and, and but I and I, I do worry a little bit about the confirmation bias um, when we when we filter. I was thinking about that with my own RSS feeds. Um, you know how I went, I went and looked through the diversity of my feeds. I'm like, ooh, I I got to improve this. Um, and I love what they're doing. For those who don't know, there's an awesome climate project going on. Um, within hypothesis that maybe John or Jeremy can speak of in a second, but you know that's it's been fascinating to watch um, that effort. But Paul, in terms of crowding the page, the beautiful thing is with well, if you're in Chrome and you're or if you're using the proxy, if you don't turn it on, you just see the the source page, mm -hmm. uh, and then when you turn it on, and John, when you were all off um, for a little bit, I was telling the story of how Dan. Um, and I that was great. Didn't that was great. To, but we sort of ended up kind of giving you like writing feedback as a form of annotation um, when we were all just trying to practice playing with the tool for the first time. Not the first time, but you know. And I was explaining how you know we would leave you a comment, and then you would either go change the blog post or change your original annotations. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a there's a quality control feature there that we kind of self discovered. Um, this idea that, and because now that your 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 blog original blog post was edited, where we originally highlighted it says, "Hey, this this original section was edited," um, yeah. and as a teacher, that is just that's a phenomenal feature. Yeah, and those and those annotations, which were made on the preview of the WordPress post that ultimately appeared on the Hypothesis blog, have transferred to the published version of the Hypothesis blog. Which is a really interesting capability of Hypothesis that is a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but in effect, we alias multiple representations of the same quote unquote same document. So, what happened was Dan and I were actually editing what we thought was a private copy of what was really a draft of this blog post. Um, but because, because all of the annotations are public right now, um, and because Greg was looking at the public stream, he started to make comments. And Greg, I can't actually remember. So at the time, you did not have access to the article that we were editing, but I think I had sent you a copy. You sent me an email and asked me to provide feedback. Yeah, right, right, right. So, so you, we were having this this interaction with with Greg, even though he didn't have really access to the document that we were annotating, which was just um, incredibly interesting. <laughs> but, you know, the point is now the published article on Hypothesis' official blog has the record of the conversation that Dan and Greg and I had while the article was being formed, which, yeah, that's that's just so interesting. I'd see, I didn't, I didn't even put that, that two and two together, but as a, as a writing teacher, that to me... Um, is even more fascinating. Give me one second. I'll be right back. Great. Um, is it Yin? Are you there? Yeah. He's muted. All right. So, Jeremy, do you want to jump into some of those examples that Greg was referring to? Is that uh, the climate change piece, for example? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I how are people cool. using this? It's like, um, I want to go back one time. I keep going. Like, how long has Hypothesis been around? How long have you have people been messing with it? Hypothesis has been around for several years, but they were mostly in development. Uh, and you know, Hypothesis is just as much a, a product as uh, as John was as uh, John was mentioning as a project and advocating for annotation on the web more broadly and supporting other um, other projects that are you know building annotation technology. 
Um, so they've been, you know, slow moving. And then just last fall was when they launched publicly with the kinds of technologies that I shared earlier in the chat. So it's really only been since last fall, and it's really only been in the past couple months that they've hired people like me. We have a director of biosciences and a director of uh, scholarly communication that were hired at the same time to start to build communities around specific uses of the technology. Uh, so uh, there's not a lot of activity yet. You know, there's some organic... Uh, <coughs> Being organic. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've got some terrible allergies. The pollen count here is just awful. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, there's some this climate feedback group came through uh, uh, through Dan's you know outreach. He's out we reached out with a lot of different groups and uh, they are experts in climate change and they are annotating popular press articles on uh, climate change. Uh, and basically fact checking and, and calling out uh, poor poor reporting on the issues, um, and you can or follow good, or their good reporting. Yeah, or good, or, or good reporting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do we see that? So there's uh, a handful of articles that have been annotated by this group of cooperating climate scientists. Mm -hmm. There's a couple things at the Wall Street Journal. There's a couple things at the New York Times. And if you go to those articles and activate hypothesis, you will see the commentary. I'll send a link to one in the chat. Okay. Very nice. So, Yen, are you there yet? I think she just needs to turn on, turn her mic. Oh, no, she's unmuted. I think she's... Yen? I think she said in the other chat that she's not plugged in with the camera and mic, so okay. she's just oh. We'll manage. All right, so... Um, so we've had it. We've had we've experimented a little bit on youth voices, and and one of the th one of the things that um, I was able to figure out is is how to use that script thing to put into youth voices, and I can't figure out how to put it like on the whole site or where to put it. It's a Drupal site, and I'm trying to figure it out, but it shows up on anybody's profile, for example. It shows up on anybody and anybody who posts something that's attached to what we call a mission. It shows up there too. And I've found lots of different ways to, to put them on, to put hypotheses onto text that we then embed onto the missions, for example. And I can show a couple examples of that. Ian, are you there? Looks like you are. Say hello. Yeah. It sounds like Ian's com computer's giving us a little feedback. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Paul, one thing you might want to tell your your kids, luckily they they mm -hmm. program the workaround so it ignores that. Um, but as a culture, we're so we're so trained to put the hashtag in front of our tags. Um, but in hypothesis it's really not necessary. But when you're at the stream, they've actually made it so if you do have, you know, I'm looking at pound uh, youth voices now or just youth voices. Both of those um, tags will bring you to the same stream. So right. and um, and yeah, that's and we a, were having a cultural shift. We're just people will always tag with yeah. the pound sign now. We we're having a smaller problem of whether to put the space between the two words too. <laughs> um, but, yeah. yeah, space is a very 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, but um, so just j uh, to address the like public, but um, how do you say this? A waiting pool. Like, it, it, I think it's important to remind you guys, if, if you don't mind, that our students are learning how to annotate, right? Like, what is a good annotation is, is not clear to them yet. Um, so I'm just, so, so for example, if you go to youthvoices.net slash little brother, <laughs> I, I took that novel, and which is, you know, freely open, to everybody and 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 put it up on youth voices and then just use the script to um, Cory Doctorow's novel there and just use the 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 script to make that annotatable right so that's a, a place again just did this yesterday but um, that's kind of some of the thinking I've been doing also PDFs embedding PDFs on stuff um, um, is another 
use that we're kind of trying to figure out together? The, the PDF feature is probably what drew me here more than anything because it's the only, besides, you know, Digo and, and, and the um, iOS or Android PDF annotation apps, it's the only, it's the web-based annotation tool for PDFs that I find works the best, um, especially because I can annotate locally on my own computer and then have other people see those same annotations if they open up the, the same PDF from the same URL. Right. So, so, and Paul, when you're talking about how to teach kids how to annotate, that's definitely something I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. Over in the, um, the Etherpad, I just dropped in a link to, this is a set of tags that I did a hackathon with folks. And we're like, well, what if we were to teach kids how to annotate for argumentation and how to annotate, um, you know, for credibility? Um, what would we need to teach them? What could be some of the tags we'd want our students to use? So as a teacher, I could sort through all of Jimmy's tags where he was evaluating the author. Um, so we just did this on Twitter one night and just banged out what would be the code book to teach source evaluation and tagging. Um, so that might be something like with the, the script that you're doing with your um, Youth Voices group. It was very beneficial, and we, we debated, and we kind of we were trying to get down to the, the what would be the goal of the annotation, and an example, and a tag. Because um, you're right, we we need to we we have to think about our students as you know learning and getting enculturated into the open web, um, so that they can eventually help build a better open web. Um, so this is I don't know if it will work, but this is what I've been trying to do. But, Paula, you also just talked about the idea of process and that a student might not be ready to, to, you know, finalize an annotation or publish an annotation, at least not publicly, and wanting to have spaces in which that kind of practice can take place before the sort of public, published uh, yeah. demonstration of knowledge? Yes, I, I, except that I'm never interested in totally private. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is why I talk about wading pools or, or shallower water, right? Um, so yeah, so so the so the Cory Doctorow novel is available, and, and I, we could have I, I could have just made a link to that, right? And our kids could have annotated there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but what I chose to do was copy it and put it on Youth Voices, and then make that the place where they are publicly annotating that text, right? Yeah, so it's, and I just want to call out really quickly that Paul and, and, and I think I mentioned this before and Greg are both uh, teacher hackers in this way. I mean, you have this, this is essentially a private version. I mean, I guess it's open to the uh, to the web since I just linked to the Cory Doctorow, uh, you mm -hmm. know, link, but um, it's essentially a private space. There's not going to be any way that other people are going to really discover um, these students' annotations on this text, well, especially if you were to put it behind some kind of firehole. Um but it's not the Cory Doctorow text, so you've essentially created a, a private, you know, space for them to do public annotation. Yeah, I think that's the goal. Yen, are you there yet? No? He's working on it? You're muted right now. Yeah, sorry. Um, as a little background, Yin discovered... Uh, you can unmute. Um, Yin discovered... Uh, oh, there you are. No, she's still... Uh, what was wrong with her, her audio driver? Okay. Um, I, I hope I don't miss it for you. If I do, uh, drop it in the chat, and I I will. Um, Go ahead, Greg. I will bring in. But Yin, um, I, I might say this wrong. Is at the um, Alt Lab at VCU, or the I don't know the exact name of what it is. Um, but it's it's uh, just a cool group that hang out with Har Howard Gardner and um, and John Becker, VCU Alt Lab. Um, and she discovered hypothesis because I annotated one of her blog posts that popped up in something else, and I just, um, cool. uh, and then she's been kind of introducing the faculty there to the product, so uh, there's a lot of kind of organic growth um, that can happen, and, and what I, what I, for me, when we're talking about teaching our kids is, well, are we annotating in the public? Are we being the models, you know, that of, of open writers and readers that, that our students need. Um, did I just say Howard Gardner? I meant Gardner Campbell. Uh, I was going to uh, say he would love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, it's, it's so late. This show is so late. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so, yeah. 
So, what was I going to say? Oh, so can I, here's 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 the question I came here with, though, um, and I wanted to go back for a second and say that some of us have been you you call us teacher hackers, but you know for a long time now I don't know how many years we we used to take articles and and paste them into Google Docs right and use the commenting feature um, to have kids have their annotations public and so forth and we, we were messing around with Genius. And, and there's a whole collection linked on Youth Voices to um, a folders and folders of Crocodoc um, documents that kids have annotated. Um, and I just want, I, I just, I kind of, what I'm, what I'm trying to ask is how do we, how do you see hypothesis as not just being yet another attempt at making the conversation happen? And I have a positive way to ask that question and you can respond. But um, I'm interested in annotation being just more than a hit and run. Like just more than just like, okay, this is what I think of this. So how do we make the annotations become discussions? It's, it's there in the tool, right? But how do we encourage that to happen? Well, I think uh Based on my experience as a teacher, you know, I remember when I first started using blogs in the classroom, and I'd say, okay, you know, this set of students are going to blog on this day, and I thought everybody would just naturally comment on the blogs, all the other students. And I had to build that into the assignment. I had to say, okay, these three are publishing this day. The rest of you, the rest of you, U17 are, in, are responsible for responding. Um, so I think you have to build that in. Uh, and you have to foreground the sort of discursive aspect of it, the fact that there are annotations and there are replies and that this is an ongoing conversation. Um, but like you said, it is there in the tool as well. So I think uh, the tool so encourages So what can you do it. in the tool? In, in a reply, can you add an image? Can you... I, I yeah, I, I think you have, the same, you have the same functionality as you do with an annotation. You can tag uh, replies as well. Um, they show up in your stream, I believe. John can correct me. Uh, Images, um, images show up embedded. Um, links show up embedded. You can use Markdown. Um, if I mean, if you know it, I don't. You can use maps. You can use maps. Yeah. Um, go ahead, John. You, you, I forgot you're there with the blue screen. No, you, you got it. I mean, that's that's right. Um, it's it's a really fun feature, and like one of the hacks I've done with kid, not here, but I, I want to bring in is you know the reactionary GIF um, response assignment is always a, a fun one to do. Um, which is you know, and and it works because you can throw the you can throw your uh you can throw your gifts right into the annotations, um, which is a, it's a kids really enjoy doing that assignment. Um, so, so, so I, so but I think Paul, your question was like, is this I have so I have, I have another way to ask the question. Yeah, because I don't think we got distinguish this product from delicious, from bookmarking sites, from right. you know all the other sites. It does feel like it's there's something fresh, there's something new. There's some, I mean. When people look at it first, you know, I, I I got a couple emails back when I put this announcement out and said this looks like a game changer. You know, people are kind of excited about it. So how would you distinguish this from that other stuff? So it's funny you should ask that because we had a retreat last week and we also had a um, our annual conference. And at the conference, one of the breakout sessions was exactly how do we differentiate what Hypothesis is doing or what web annotation generally is doing from social bookmarking. Because in fact we are a superset of social bookmarking, right? So as a long time delicious guy who, I mean, kind of wrote the book on delicious, right? I mean I went to the mat with that thing and I think I understood it as well as anybody on the planet. Um, and uh, and then now of course I'm on Pinboard because it's delicious, you know, went south. but. Um, you know, so we're a superset of that, right? You can use Hypothesis as if it were Delicious or Digo or Pinboard, right? In the sense that you might make a page level annotation, which is not pointing to a selection within the text, right? It's just pointing to the document and assigning one or more tags to the document and making those tags available in a public space that other people can observe or not observe and interact with or not interact with, right? So you know, that's social bookmarking. That's us, too. What we fundamentally add to the equation is, and it was useful to sort of go through that breakout session to really boil this down, and we add two things, right? We add the possibility of 
pointing to a fragment of the thing, not the thing as a whole. And the fragment might be a selection of text, or the fragment might be a selection of audio, or video, or of a region of an image. Right? All of these um, possibilities are contemplated in the in the standard, in the annotation standard that's being developed in the W3C right now. And although those capabilities are not part of Hypothesis right now, they are demonstrable in other applications that are built using Annotator, which is part of the Hypothesis system. So that's part of it, is, is uh, referring to a piece of a resource, of a web resource, not the resource as a whole. The other piece of it is the expectation that those comments or annotations or whatever you want to call them will be in one way or another discoverable in the context of the of, of however it is that you view the original resource. Right? So if I've annotated you know, your web page, a visitor to that web page has the ability to discover those annotations and see that there is a layer existing on top of that resource. And similarly, if it's audio or video or an image, right? And those, I think, are the two fundamental distinctions that differentiate web annotation from social bookmarking. And I'm actually asking the question, because I haven't completely resolved this yet, have we missed anything, or does that cover it? Paul. For me, the big difference between these and the other tools are, like I said, the, the philosophy of open that is just baked into it. I was wrong. It's not, it's not a Creative Commons um, by SA. It's just a, the most blanket Creative Commons license. They're, I mean, it's just they're free to use, um, any annotation, and that they're built on these open web standards. So, mm -hmm. technically, you know, down the line, if there was another high, another company that came along that used the same web standards, they could import all of these. Annotations. It's it's an open framework standard by the W3C, and that's and that's that to me. I think is something that's that's pretty new. Well, new being back to the back to the beginning, um, but this idea that the philosophy of open that I have never seen any of the other tools. The other tools are kind of siloed off, kind of walled gardens per se. Um, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying because now you have new voices. You have the Croc Docs. You have the Google Doc Commons. You have you have annotated examples everywhere, but I'm hoping and let me just, this is a huge web standard that something might be different this time. And just to, to, to wrap in Jeremy's comment back to that, you know, build it into the assignment, like, yeah, I did that and do that, um, but it's hard to get, like, we're, we're a community and of, of teachers working across the country, and it's hard for me to engage those other teachers and say, you know, come over here and look at this text uh, together, right? So that's that's the piece that's still really hard. I gotta say, <laughs> I don't. I, but but I also and if I could bring John's comment way long ago about this becoming a live stream, that that's my goal with students too is to recognize that yeah, I'm doing this because I'm in Mr. Allison's class and he's assigning me to do it right now, but. How, how do we get them to kind of understand that this is something that's going to be around for them? Yeah. Show them I, not the that you have answers. Stuff. Go ahead. What? I'd show them the climate feedback stuff. I'd show them, you know, examples of it happening in the wild, that they're not alone in this project, that their class projects are part of a larger project, that, you know, people are talking back to the web, and uh, they're part of that. Um, and the climate feedback is, you know, the most advanced climatologists, scientists, climatology scientists in the, you know, in the world reading articles in newspapers and magazines that your students will have heard of and commented on, commenting on them, that it's part of that scholarly practice, but that also, you know, I think this is also could be seen as a sophisticated version of what people do on Facebook and Twitter, what young people do on Facebook and Twitter. They're always commenting, they're always annotating in a sense. Um, and this is just a more rigorous uh, way to do it, uh, in my opinion, and one that I think ties very cl nicely into education. And to, to build off of John's first point, the granularity of, of, comment of commentary taking place on the level of, of a few words or a sentence or a few lines of text on the Internet is obviously something to me as an English teacher that warms my pedagogical heart because that is where I want kids to be having conversation, and that is where this technology enables people to have 
extensive conversation. I would also point them, Paul, to the to the work that's been done by my friend Jim Groom <laughs> at the University of Mary Washington, which is now taking root and becoming what I hope will be a movement, if we could call it that. Um, so I'm kind of guessing everybody in this call knows about this, but in case not, right? There's this there's this notion um, that um, I've been thinking about for a long time, and that Jim has taken up and now calls a domain of one's own. And so the notion is that as a student at a university, it wouldn't really anymore make sense for the university to provide you with some sort of institutional identity on the web and in some sort of institutionally provided web infrastructure, right? Because you arrive at the university already enmeshed in your own cyber infrastructure. And that is going to go with you when you leave the university, it's part of your life, right? And while you're at the university, what you want to do is is federate or integrate with the systems that the university is running. But in the end, you've got your stuff. You had it before you came to the university. You will have it after you leave the university. It's your stuff. It's your life stream, right? And um, you know we're we're set up to support that model, and I think that that is revolutionary. Because it's not Facebook, right? It's it's not, you know, you're not a sharecropper, you know, you're not, uh, you know, you're not the product, uh, uh, you know, of the thing that you're not paying for, right? You are you're the you are the source of this stuff, and it's yours, and it travels with you through your life. And that's profound. Yeah, it's great. And we could end there, except I do have one. I'm over time, but if I could ask just one other question um, about the business model here. <clears throat> like, um, is 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 you know, is hypothesis aiming to make money eventually, or what's the what's the goal in terms of? So look at WordPress, yeah. right? Look, yeah. WordPress is running, I guess, twenty percent of the of the websites in the world, right? And a whole bunch of those are free websites on WordPress.com, and you know some of them are licensed websites that people are paying for support and other services. And that's the model, right? I mean, you know, if this gets to be as big as it wants to be, there's going to be a huge space for open and free, and there's going to be a nice little corner for commercial, and those things will happily coexist. It makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sure. Um, anybody with any kind of last thoughts as we wrap up here tonight? Jeremy, you have anything you'd like to add? I uh, just want to make myself available as a resource for any teachers that are watching here. I uh, put my name in the chat, my, ad, my email address in the chat, Jeremy Dean at Hypothesis uh, with the .is. But uh, I want to be high touch and involved in, in, with folks that are interested in, in testing out the product and using it with classes. So feel free to reach out with questions concerns, uh, just to have, you know, pedagogical conversations about how this can be applied in the classroom, uh, I'm available as a resource. Very cool. Thank you. Greg, anything to add? Um, no, just that uh, uh, it's a fun place and come play. Um, because it's not a place. It's, it's, uh, it's an ideal. Um, there is no, it doesn't exist in one place. It's wherever you build it. Um, so go play in your own spaces. Um, and and learn and live out loud. And we're gonna have to hear more about your question the web. Yeah, well, experience um, at, at a later point. That'll be another show. It was it was supposed to happen in May, but I ran into S back in Park. Cool. Um, so it got pushed to fall. We'll get back to you on it. John, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Any last thoughts that you have? Well, yeah, to echo what what um, Jeremy and and Greg both said, um, we're wide open right now for feedback and imagine if you were an early Twitter user, right, like in, I don't know, 2006, if that's the year that it was, um, you could have had a significant role in shaping the early evolution of that technology. And it's the same with us right now. We're like when Twitter was new. And if you're interested, we're wide open to feedback and engagement and, and um, you know, come and help us make this happen. It's cool. And the educational community, as you seem to know already, is a great uh, place for that. So thank you yeah. for yeah. offering that. Um, great.
Karen? Thanks, everybody. Are you gone? Or? Yeah. I guess so. So just just to close out here, just to say that we are um, we're here every Wednesday night um, at edtechtalk.com slash ttt, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lee both set up. Thank you all, um, and we'll talk to you again soon. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night, Karen. Good seeing you again. You too.